Well, of course there are. Um, you know, half the planet lives on $2.50 a day. The challenge is the people that complain that they're the 99% against the 1% are actually the 1%. He goes, Tony, what are you talking about? Yeah, you those, talking? those people down there who were in those tents downstairs, <laughs> you know, a few years ago, and they're, if you watch them typing on their iPhones and having a Starbucks drink, they think that they are really suffering. But in reality, if you make, if you're in poverty in this country, you're in the 1% of earners in the world. You're the top 1%. So if you really care about the 1%, you got to care about everybody. But the real challenge, I think, is not so much money as it is that the world has changed. If you are a blue collar worker, if you're an unskilled worker, meaning you're not tech oriented, you're not cognitively driven in your job, you're going to have trouble. And I don't care what the politicians say about bringing these jobs back. There are no jobs to bring back. And the reason is because technology is making labor less valuable. And that's why jobs don't produce as much unless you're high cognitive, high decision making, high tech. Those people have no problem. There's a 1% unemployment for people who make $100,000 or more. It's so tiny because they've learned to become more valuable. I always tell people the most valuable lesson I got from my mentor, Jim Rohn, was I asked my father worked two jobs. We were always broke. We had no money for food. And we lived in a community we moved to, which was, I thought they were all rich and we were on the other side of the tracks. It was lower middle class, but compared to where we lived before, these people seemed rich compared to us. And I, I just didn't understand it. And Jim said to me, Tony, it's not about the value of your soul. It's about the value of you in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And your father's skills are not that valuable. He used to take, he was an underground parking attendant, and he would take people's ticket and make change. Well, the research now shows it's being done at Yale, it's being done overseas in England as well, and they found that 40% of all jobs they project in the next 10 years are going to disappear because of technology. It's going to be replaced by an algorithm, it's going to be changed, you know, all these guys on Wall Street, you're seeing all these algorithms take over and they're getting rid of all these traders, right? It's changing radically these, in these hedge funds. There's 3 million truck drivers. Self-driving cars are here, in the next five years they will be the standard, certainly within seven or eight years. Are you going to hire someone who can only work eight hours a day and sometimes gets drunk or can make a mistake when you can buy a machine, write down the machine, and be in a position where it works 24 hours a day driving? But no one is telling these drivers this, and it's, they have to retool now. So technology is the biggest challenge. Labor is less valuable because of efficiencies with technology, and it's going to get better and better for technology, which is scary when you think about what's going to happen for jobs. So I say to people, you've got to participate in your own rescue. You've got to retool yourself. The idea that Bernie Sanders has of providing free education sounds wonderful, but the education he wants to do is community college. There are no skill sets in community colleges today, for the most part, that are going to prepare you for the economy or a job that's there. So what is that going to do? You're just going to waste more money, more time. We need to retool ourselves. The government's not going to do it for you. And a great leader in a company is retraining their people all the time. The training never stops because that is the innovative, creative marketing edge is your own people. Most companies do less training today than they did 20 or 30 years I know, ago. It's crazy. So where do you get the training? I think they have to self-educate. I mean, I'm an example of that myself. You have to say, what's an area that I want to become masterful in because dabblers will never have any financial freedom. You know, if you're going to run a company, you've got to find what is your niche. What is it you're going to do better than anybody else? Every one of us individuals have to say that and then say, now, where do I get that education? In a world that we live in today with the internet, where there's education from all the world, from MIT, from Harvard, online, and there are people you can go to work for who you could become a mentee of. There's just so many approaches, but you can't have a standard education and expect to have an extraordinary life. It's not going to happen. The one breakthrough for all leaders is constant, never-ending improvement. And that means educating yourself and continuing to develop even greater emotional mastery because that's what affects whether you execute or not. Breakdowns, it's certainly not something I experience, but it's not because I'm so talented or so mm -hmm. brilliant or so fearless. It's just you're like an athlete. You're an athlete. Yeah. You're in shape. Yeah. Right? You're not going to have a reaction in your body like somebody who doesn't take care of themselves. Right. So, you know, I believe I don't believe in emotional intelligence. I think it's useful, but I'm mm. more interested in emotional fitness. Because mm. intelligence is a capability. Fitness is a state of readiness. Interesting. If you are fit, you can take that demand right now and you can deal with it. You can deal with that physical stress, that emotional stress. Same thing's true with psychological fitness, emotional fitness, right? So I'm, I'm pretty fit. And part of that is not because I'm so smart. Part of it is that I've taught this for decades. Yeah. I remember I had a woman who came to one of my seminars in um, 
in her, I don't know, early 80s probably. And she would run in this room, five, 10,000 people. I think it was, you know, she went a couple of 10,000 person events. And she would get in this front row, fight her way through there. And she'd jump and go for it. And at one break, she came up to me, I was signing a book for her. And she says, uh, she goes, Mr. Robbins, I've seen you at like eight of these. She goes, <laughs> I've seen you like when you're really, I know, I can hear your voice, uh -huh. you're hurting, or you haven't slept. And she goes, you always seem to be so up all the time. How come right. you're so up? And I said, well, part of it is I attend all these seminars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm teaching it. So I, there's a fitness of that. But there's also, you know, I've, I've buried three fathers and, and one mother, and, you know, mm. that affects your life. I've, uh, you know, I've had a physician look me in the eye and say, you have a tumor in your brain. Wow. And so I've had those moments that, when you've had extreme stress and you push your way through it, you build psychological muscle. Yeah. It's like it takes a lot to knock me off. You know, in the early days, we didn't have fifty thousand dollars to keep the doors open. How do we do it? Then I had, you know, graduated to five million. Then I graduated to uh, a partner that of mine who kind of didn't do things well, and I ended up owning a hundred million dollars because I had to take on his debts. Uh -huh. Hundred million dollars. And but when you do all that stuff, you know, now my companies do five billion, you know, right. a year. So. Uh, you, you, you keep expanding what I would call really the circle of your, th the threshold of your influence. Sure. You know, everybody has a threshold of control. And if you get beyond it, you kind of freak out. So it, it takes a little bit more. I don't have, I can't so you don't have breakdowns. I don't have a breakdown. I mean, do I get pissed off or get frustrated <laughs> or tired? Yeah, but breakdown, honestly, no. So, so how do you handle it if you get tired or something? I sleep <laughs> <laughs> when I can. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, it's honestly, it's pretty simple. But, you know, when I've, when I've had uh, challenging times, I mean, I have so many tools. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, it doesn't I, happen. I, I pull them out. It's, and most of it's, so it's like you as an athlete. You know, you don't just physically break down. Right. right? You take care of yourself. So I'm constantly I think, training that I think muscle. most people don't train their mind and emotions. It's like, mm -hmm. I think the most powerful muscles to me are not physical. They're as strong as important as they are. It's like... Faith is a muscle. Courage yeah. is a muscle. Determination is a muscle. Playfulness is a muscle. You know, passion unexpressed weakens. You know, faith untested gets smaller. Yeah. So uh, I'm always, I, I call it deep practice. I'm always pushing myself to the edge, yeah. and pushing yourself to the edge makes you stronger. You know, uh, I, th I think I can boil it down probably to three or four words. Money, power, ego, habit. Uh, that's a short answer. Uh, a friend of mine, well, uh, a friend of mine who is my friend until we have this conversation in, in, the, uh, in academia, I've asked him once, I said, why evolution, for example? The DNA evidence, very recent, in the last five years, the DNA evidence no longer supports the theory of evolution as the, the mechanism for human origins. Evolution is a fact. And as a, I want to be very clear about that. As a geologist, I've seen it in the fossil record, plants, animals, insects, some primates. Something happened 200,000 years ago, and the theory breaks down when it comes to humans. And the DNA shows us that. The DNA shows us very clearly that we did not descend from Neanderthal, for example. The, their genome, we can now rebuild their genome and compare theirs to ours. We can actually, it sounds like Jurassic Park, the movie. Science fiction, but it's science fact. We can pull the DNA. You can check your percentage of Neanderthal in We can you, pull right? the DNA from the bone marrow of fossilized remains of beings that we are supposed to be descended from and compare their uh, DNA to ours. We didn't descend from Neanderthal. It shows that we did appear on Earth about 200,000 years ago. Where did we come from? Right. Well, you're, to answer the question, where... Why aren't, we, why aren't we sharing this? When I asked my friend at the university, I said, why can't you share this with your students? And he said, Greg, you don't understand. He says, if I shared that, he said, it would invalidate my 40-year career as, as a professor. And I said, no. I said, it would do just the opposite. It would demonstrate to your young students how valid and relevant science is because it's designed to be constantly updated. And you're doing that. It wouldn't invalidate. He said, he said, well, think how much money it would cost to change the textbooks. And I said, my it's brother, I, I said, <laughs> you're living in the Stone Age. They're not using textbooks. You changed it on the server. And you've changed it everywhere. And he said, he said, well, think of all my class notes I would have to change. And I said, well, that's your job. But this is, that was an example for me of, uh, it, it's a habit. It, it's a habit. But it's also threatening. And here's, this is why I think it's so important, Brian. It's more than a philosophical conversation. As we globalize, as we push ourselves together and we see the fear of what that means, cultures coming together in different ways of thinking, we also see a rise in hate. And hate is only possible because of a way of thinking. Rachel Carson was an author in the 1960s. She wrote uh, Silent Spring. She was one of the first environmental authors 
about the use of uh, the pesticide uh, DDT back in the 1960s. And she, she made a statement, I read this when I was a kid, and it was so powerful. She said, we only destroy the things that we don't value. We have been taught that human life has very little value through the theory of evolution, that we are a random process, genetic mutations. The textbook says that life is a behavior pattern that chemical systems exhibit when they reach a certain level of complexity. That's the definition of life that we're giving to our young people in school today. And it is such a sterile definition. It, it leaves no room for the, the specialness and the preciousness of life. And so our young people, through the video games that are very heartless, uh, very violent, through the, the media, through the television, uh, where are we instilling into our young people how precious and special life is? And if we're going to change that, when we begin to see what the DNA is telling us, it tells us something something far beyond random genetic mutations is responsible for us and that's I think where the change in thinking must begin. Well it's interesting that you asked me that question that my, one of my answers for people when they say hey how can I get better at detaching and controlling my ocean, m emotions I tell them to start training Jiu Jitsu mm -hmm. because you're gonna get tapped out in Jiu Jitsu your ego is gonna get smacked around <laughs> so hard you're gonna lose your mind and what you in the, the, the more the matter you get the more aggressive you are the more you're going to get beat down and the worse it's going to be. So you have to learn to control your emotions. No doubt about it. And then what you have to do is you have to start practicing it all the time. You have to start paying attention to the, to the, the red flags that go up when I start raising my voice at you. I go, oh, that's, that's your emotion. <laughs> get mad. And, and for me, like the minute I feel some sort of anger, some sort of jealousy, some sort of frustration mm -hmm. most of the time I go oh you're getting mad that's your ego that's your that's you're getting emotional about this take a step back and listen to what the other person is saying take a step back and try and see it from their perspective take a step back and try and understand what they're trying to say because sometimes you know if you're not a if you're not a very articulate person you're just making me mad it's only because I don't understand what you're trying to say take a step back let's talk through it so pay attention to you know I always talk about when you're sending an email to someone and you're typing like this don't don't send that email that's not a good email to send that's an emotional email wait write it out fine and then save it and read it later and you'll realize oh yeah I was really mad about something or I was really frustrated so how do you do it you practice it you pay attention to your emotions and you get control over them have kids if you have kids you'll have to learn to get control of your emotions <laughs> How do you gain influence and respect? Like, what's that process? Very similar to when we talked about trust and building trust and giving trust. If I want to gain the ability to influence you, well, then what I have to do is give you the ability to influence me. And when I say, hey, here's what we're trying to make happen. Here's what I want to do. And you say, well, I think we should do it like this. You know what I should say? Okay, well, let's take a look at that. The more I allow you to influence me, the more open your mind gets for me to influence you. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to allow you to influence me. And the more I allow that to happen, the more influence I'm going to have. Mm -hmm. Respect, same thing. If I treat you like you're a plebe, like you don't matter, you're not going to respect me at all. But if I treat you with respect, and respect you when you try and talk to me and I, I listen and I respect what you're saying and I try and understand it fully then your respect for me is gonna go up as well so when you want to when you want to earn respect give respect when you want to earn influence give influence when you want to earn trust give trust all those three are related whatever position you're at you want to be the bull and I don't care if you're in the mail room or if you're the person behind that camera that I'm gonna be better than anybody else with that camera and I'm gonna be the best male uh, carrier and the person who comes up and is the most organized and does it the most professional way you can be the bull at any position you're doing and it's just telling yourself I'm gonna do this better than anybody else I don't care what the job is I don't care what you do you be the bull at what you do it's just the sport of this is what I do every day 
And people said, why, why do you do this? And I just said, because what would I do? I mean, if I can't come to the office and solve problems and fight with everybody and, and conquest something, you know, conquer, then, then what am I going to do with myself? I'm going to sit home and die? I mean, that's what I enjoy doing. This is my basketball. This is my game that I play. This is my pickup uh, uh, monopoly game, whatever you want to call it. Okay, this is, I love going to the office and, and, and leading people and, and trying to conquer something. That's what I enjoy doing. It's sport. Totally, that's, you're exactly right. This is, this is steps to get to the next level. Now, if I don't pull any of that off, have I reached that point in life where I'm happy? Yeah, I don't feel like, after I bought the Houston Rockets, uh, and once again, I, you know, who gets to own 100% of their team in their hometown? There's probably not, of all the major 100 sports teams, there's probably not five. So I feel very fortunate. So if nothing else is accomplished, do I feel pretty good? I feel okay. I really do. I, I really do. And I thank the, you know, the good Lord and, and, and all the people that helped me accomplish it. But, but what you just said is happening. I'm taking the next steps right now to get to the next level.